that's where you're going to get the, the genetic response of resistance. And that's also the condition we make our selections up here. We could give everybody, everybody could give a round of applause to Catherine. For a few minutes. Let me comment on two questions that, that, that Rob, you asked about, um, relative, about the aromas. It does, as Robert said, it doesn't appear that there's direct linkages between an aroma and the cause of downy mildew or the fusarium, but there is an association. But part of that is because the limited number of our progenate or individual plants that we look at are overly dominant by a higher number of methylcavicol. So if we have 20 plants that look great and 15 of them are methylcavicol, then you get that impression. But the truth is, if we had a wider screen, like you would have on a regular agronomic crop where we could grow hundreds and thousands of plants, then the numbers of the linalool types would be high enough so that we could see that a little bit better. So we have this problem with a lot of things. We have the problem with chilling tolerant, we get the methylcavicol carryover. We have the problem with downy mildew, we get the methylcavicol carryover. Methylcavicol is just a, a, a component that you want in sweet basil, but you want it in very low concentrations. But when you cross it, it has a tendency go higher. Even commercial seed companies, in the absence of diseases, sometimes the progeny of seed that they've sold that you have reached you growers, at least in the past, have sometimes not always tasted and smelled the same way, even though phenotypically it's the same. So there's an association, but it's not a link. The methylcalcal activity as an antibacterial side, that actually is real, but it has not been really related now to the potential fungus or over my sites. The other issue with the, I'd like to just comment on Catherine's work with the fusarium. We started this, I don't know, like 15, 20 years ago. You know, you had done some of the leading work of identifying it, showing how it was spread and caused. We we're very excited to work with the original NUFAR, by the way, in Israel. My friends bred it and de developed it, and we thought we'd have an easy time of just taking the uh, genes out of NUFAR and, and crossing with other things, and so a lot of other sweet basils would be resistant. And what we found back then was that the isolates that we were using it when we were at Purdue, it turned out the new farm did get fusarium. It just it, it was tolerant of it. It took higher inoculum densities for it to collapse. And there was a couple week delay of which it would on, onset. And I mention that now because a similar issue with downy mildew fusarium takes place relative to whether you, if you don't have strong resistance but you have some degree of tolerance. And can you get a crop out quick? and to avoid the onset of the presence of the disease, and then you may not have to worry about it. But when we redid this fusarium, we actually had a lot of really beautiful lines that we were crossing in with downy mildew, and we weren't cocky, but we had confidence that, well, we had this resistance to fusarium, let's cross it in for the downy mildew. We have the sweet basil phenotype, we got the aroma, we have all these beautiful types, and Catherine's work has shown us that, whoops, we made the assumption that the resistance that we had back then may not still hold up now. So then the question is, is it that the plant loses resistance over time through generations? Is it that the isolates of the fusarium, which are known to be heterogeneous and not homogeneous, continue to mutate and vary? Which, by the way, wouldn't be surprising, but does then lead to all the other lines that have been reported to be resistant, to question whether they're truly resistant, or is it a concentration dependency? And on our screens on purpose, we go a little wild on trying to go very heavy in the inoculum density on purpose, okay? Perhaps using inoculum density of fusarium that you might not see in a normal field, but you might see in a really heavily infested field on purpose because we're doing the lazy breeding approach. We don't want to come back and talk to you about having to do another fusarium resistance. So we figure if we do fusarium resistant plant under inoculum so that's growing the basil in a fusarium swamp, it's going to last for a long period of time. And we don't want to make the resistance based on one isolate. We want to make the resistance based on, but well, we're not quite sure how many. But the last times we did it, we based it on a tank mix of four different isolates that came from divergent areas and regions so that we would hope that the plant would not build up or the fusarium would not build up resistance to the genetic resistance by the host plant. Does that make sense? So it looks good for you one year, and then next year all of a sudden starts to break down, and two or three years it really breaks down further, and then we're back to the drawing board. So we really want to do it on multiple virulent. And one of the problems with looking at, at fusarium that researchers have, have recognized, but I don't know if it's always been done, is sometimes the fungus 
that Catherine worked on, right? You saw those pictures. Some of it grows really fast. Okay, so as a researcher, it's great. I come in, the, the fungus looks great. I subject it, I subject my plant to it, but the fungus might grow good, but that in itself, and you've known this, Rob, with all your work on Fusarium, it can lose its virulence over time. So you have something that grows great and has no pathogenicity to it. So we, we have to find the isolates that both grow adequately enough to raise enough material to subject our plants to, and is really pathogenic. So what we want are the most virulent pathogens that come from a divergent area in high inoculum densities to reattract with this. The concern right now is NUFAR and the others that are reporting seed catalogs to be resistant to Fusarium will likely be resistant to a certain inoculum density of a certain particular isolate at one point in time, and it's no longer. So I think this is something that seed companies need to be aware of, growers need to be aware of, and, and we hope that eventually um, the new materials that are reported as fusarium resistant will truly be resistant, or at least labeled in an appropriate manner. So the question that we're asking now, and, and I'm sure others that are working on fusarium with basil, I'm sure are finding the same thing. We were just surprised to find a loss of that resistance. So when you asked Catherine whether it was repeated, the question is, yes, it needs to be repeated several times. But if it was everything grew great, the ones that we had, we thought were resistant and it wasn't affected, then that could have given us a false positive with one run. But if we subject to something once and we know it's dying to the fusarium, then we'll subject it two or three times because we're neurotic. But if it's dying to it one time, then we have confidence it might have lost its pathogen, it's lost its resistance, and that's the concern we have. Now, in most trials with basil, okay, because a lot of these are still non-domesticated plants, in the average, it takes about one plant per 6,000 plants to find that in, in Fusarium it's a single dominant gene, or purported to be a single dominant gene. It takes one plant per 6,000 to find that resistance. So it sounds like a lot, right? But it is a relatively rapid um, method to achieve that number of screens. And given what we're finding now, we, we hope that we'll reintroduce fusarium resistance with it. Does that answer your question? So the question now we're all looking for in ourselves too is no matter how fast we go, we're never going fast enough. No matter how much we want, we always want more. And the question is, where are we now and, and what are our plans as we go ahead? So I just want to try to bring together all the different really fine work that Robert's done, that Catherine's done, and that all of us as a team have, have contributed to. And I'm just talking about the overview now, is we want a plant that is uniform, resistance over different locations, it's stable, and we could use different breeding strategy. We know that we can make a tremendous amount of progress using open pollinated. We know now that basil, despite going through many, many, many generations, you get beautiful inbred lines without inbreeding depression, meaning it, and yet when you recross them, it gets the characteristic heterosis that we, we like for the hybrids. We could do this through single plant selection, which is what we're doing. We're not really doing it through mass selection per se, but once you get lines down the road, you could take that and make a mass selection, or you could use a combination approach. I want all the growers to recognize that even though Rob's discussion sounded very sophisticated, it was not using genetically modified approaches. It was classic breeding, where he has to get up super early in the morning, everybody that's helping him gets up early in the morning and making the th hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of crosses. And it takes a lot to do these crosses, particularly with very divergent species. But it's not GMO. I, I want to make sure everybody, everybody recognizes that. Sometimes when you talk genetics, we all have an assumption now that everything is GMO, where the lines that we're working on and, and hope to be able to share with everybody else is using traditional breeding in potentially non-conventional, non-traditional manner. And we want need to have the inheritance of the targeted traits for the stability, particularly for the aromas. And that's what we've done. So our, our breeding program is looking at uh, breeding and hybrid development. Uh, we talked about one case. Robert talked about the MRI uh, crossing with the SB22 family selections. The SB22 is one of the Rutgers longstanding breeding lines that we've been doing for, for a sweet basal phenotype. The other is a sterile interspecific F1 hybrid, and I'll, I'll make more comments on that. Robert talked and showed you the pictures of what happens sometimes when you can cross two very genetically distinct plants. You get a plant, but it, it won't produce seeds. That's both good and bad, and we want to show you what might be good about it, by the way, if you like the look and you like the smell. Then it could be vegetatively propagated or tissue culture propagated, and you have something like for you, Bob, in a greenhouse, we have live plants for many, many 
to do with people that are doing it inside and are not necessarily wedded necessarily to only using seed. And then even though we don't like the term mutation breeding, truth is your filberts, your hazelnuts, a lot of your mints, um, new improved types have been developed using <coughs> mutation breeding, in that case um, a type of gamma radiation or chromosome alterations by, because by changing the chromosome number of the plants we might be able to overcome some of that sterility in some of these hybrids and be able to then develop something that we can cross with. So that's a technique that we can't say that we've done, but it's a technique that we've now discussed and is in the, in the plans for considering how best to do it. And we're looking at collaboration with another group that is doing that right now. And then looking and discussing what is tolerance and sweet basil selections in concert with other strategies. This morning during the sh very short welcome, I, I, I mentioned briefly about the concept of tolerance or ENZO, you have the intermediate resistant type. And these are very important to be used in concert with other tools and other strategies where we don't have absolute resistance. You know, maybe we eventually will have absolute resistance to one type of fusarium, but if you have in a, living in a different area and they have a different isolate, it could break down right away as some of the initial data that you just saw with Catherine. So we're looking to see how we could use tolerance, intermediate resistance. I don't like that term, by the way, but I use that because you guys in ENZA use that term. We like it as tolerance because we don't know where it is. Weakly tolerant, mildly tolerant, intensely tolerant, you know, depending on the environment, depending on where you grow it. But it does confer some delay of the onset of visual symptoms, and it has some unique applications here. And the breeding work that we're now doing is trying to use and demonstrate the stable resistance across multiple locations. You saw that we have that already, and I think we need to do that under additional locations as well. We, we're working on looking at the top um, selections that we made from evaluation from New Jersey and from Florida, and the collaboration we're getting from Rick's group in Florida, from Meg. Well, I say Meg's group, but I think it's just Meg. So Meg and Meg herself is her group, but it's fantastic, by the way, and, and all the people in New Jersey and many of you as growers that are working with us as well in companies. And if we have about approximately four selections that have traits that we think are necessary for the marketable sweet basil and downy mildew. And you can't imagine how many arguments we have within our group as to where are we along it or how close are we versus how we have to also be conservative and not try to exaggerate where we are and, and, and where we're going to go down for downy mildew. So I'll just show you a couple of pictures of check plants on, on, the, on, the, on, on the left and some, some promising plants that are you can see on the upper and the other side. These, these are plants to us that have the ba sweet basil phenotype and are exciting. These are further selections with check plants and all the other selections that, we, that are numbered. You know, we give all kinds of crazy codes and we hope we could remember and find what the codes refer to but the coded numbers are, are, are Rutgers breeding, selecting lines, and you can see them again. And, and these no longer are really odd types, are they? Remember when we first started to talk a couple years ago? Um, we had really crazy, we just more or less had the spice and we had the other things that would be interesting for an ornamental, but had nothing to do with you as a market for sweet basil. Now we're, re we're in the sweet basil business. We have the sweet basil progeny, we have the sweet basil that are resistance, and, and now the trick is, is to make sure we have the top sweet basil with the best aromas and the stability. And here are some selections from Bell Glade. I'm convinced that anything that could survive under Rick's, your conditions, between floods, waters, you know, you, you, you flame your fields with sugar cane and the basil is still somehow living and all the inoculum is taking off and it's, the plants are just covered completely. Um, and other locations where we want to go to areas with intense inoculum density, we're very happy that our plants are the only ones that have been surviving and, and not the original Czech plants, but, but the, correct me if I'm wrong, am I exaggerating at all, Rick? No. Okay, so this is good, right? I can't, you know, I'm from New York, you may not believe me, you gotta believe Rick, he's from Florida. So the numbered lines really, really look very good, and, and these are the ones in which we want to develop into varieties to the extent possible. Okay, the highly resistant, okay? And even the term of highly resistance, we're not quite sure, it's resistant or not, to tolerance, not pathologists and breeders have had these arguments for decades. You know, it's like what's beautiful versus very beautiful. So the question is, we really want things that are resistant under across different locations, under very high inoculum density, and last long, all through the season. And one of the things we've been overly critical on ourselves is we found a number of plants that did not have symptoms, or symptoms were so hard to find on the plant up until the plant started to flower. And so Andy and, and Robert and I are rating the plants. And then Wes Klein comes over and says, you guys are crazy. What do you care about that? You could have come in three weeks ago, four weeks ago, when 
growers, you guys would have harvested your crops, you wouldn't have had a problem, and you had no symptoms. Okay? So the question is, this is where the, the term tolerance and intermediate susceptibility really could give rise. Where if the plants are good and they give you the protection for a short period of time, you're not keeping it to seed. You're not keeping it. Now, a seed company may want to have, make sure they want to keep it to seed. And we all want resistance all through for multiple harvest. But if you're going for a single harvest, not a multiple harvest, then it might be something to give you potential. So here's a, a downy mildew resistant on the left. Okay, a downy mildew resistant on the right, and a downy mildew susceptible plant in the middle. Okay, so it's very clear by growing things right next to each other under disease pressure outdoors to confirm what we're learning indoors under these, these controlled systems for taking live inoculum and then subjecting it to confirm resistance that we, we feel confident. The SD, SBDM13, we have a large leaf sweet basil originally bred for resistance to fusarium wilt. Then it kind of sat on a, on a shelf for a long time. And then we realized we, we had this, what we thought was going to be fusarium resistant plant. We started to cross it back into the downy mildew. It shows tolerance of downy mildew. And this would be equal to a very highly tolerant plant. It could break down with a lot of pressure. It could break down late in the season. We may argue whether wh what level of tolerance it would be, but it looks, um, it looks very interesting. And it has the aroma and the phenotype that we want. So this is something that we, we would be considering, is how do, we, how do we work with something like that? So tolerance is easier to achieve and really difficult to sometimes define. Okay? It should, it's difficult to achieve consistency and expectations and responses across the wide locations, seasons, and field. And our consortium focus has not been on developing tolerance. It's, true, it's on developing resistance. But I think that growers and all of us have to begin to see what potential application a tolerant line or intermediate resistance lines has until better things come up on board. Increased tolerance may also be seen in, as a delay in symptom expression, less symptoms when they do appear, lower disease symptoms relative to the other really totally susceptible <coughs> crops right next to it. It could provide a niche, as I said, until true resistance is available, but also gives you false positive comfort of not um, doing it in, in concert with other management and control practices as well. In some greenhouses, under a short period of time, under some hydroponics, these types of tolerant plants could provide some good protection. Now, we had a, a theory, and I think you, you mentioned this theory last time, Rick, is that we would, and Meg, Meg, you had mentioned it again today, so last year we, we thought with the organic materials not working and working so poor, when you have so, such susceptible plants, if we could provide a plant that has some degree of tolerance, and in particular high tolerance, even if not resistance, perhaps some of those same control agents could look more effective, be it organic or not organic. That doesn't appear necessarily to be the case, as we found out from the talks early today, but I still think that theory is something to keep, con keep considering. So coupled with early seeds and production, quick maturing, single harvests, this kind of tolerance can, can find some application. We hope it would help you until we can give you something much better as well. We had bred the phenotypes in multiple locations that look excellent, and now with the right aroma and with no basal, now with no basal downy mildew, symptoms present, okay, when the plants were young prior to flowering. And so this looks good. It gives us confidence we could take it all the way to the season, multiple harvest, in fact, as well under, under good field conditions. Now, if we try to combine the multiple sources of resistance and tolerance, this is a a new type of a breeding line that we have here. This is a pedigree to gives us durable resistance. Um, we found that in one of our or in two or in our sterile hybrids, it looked good. Some people might there was an argument as to whether it has a true sweet basil taste. Others would find it to be a linalool citral taste. But it had the pheno, it had a look of a sweet basil, and it had a close enough flavor and taste that it could be sold and marketed as a special type of basil, by the way, not a traditional Genovese basil, for sure. But lo and behold, we, had a, we, had, um, we sent under an MTA our lines to a, a commercial seed company, and they found that that sterile hybrid and some of our materials actually had a virus in it. Okay, this is not good. It was a tobacco streak virus. Okay? This was detected in, as it says up here, in, in some of our a downy mildew-resistant sterile hybrid, and all of a sudden we scratched our heads and we realized that this kind of um, virus can be easily spread by thrips, and we saw in the earlier note of how many, what high percentage of you, of the people last year that reported, of the 13 anyway, 
A lot of people have thrips, and if you greenhouse grow, a thrips is pretty common anyway. Anyway, it's a ubiquitous, kind of almost innocuous virus. You don't see the symptoms. You don't really care about it. But as a breeder or a source of material, we want to make sure our material is, is clean. So we did run in since la our last year a problem with some of our genetic material having the tobacco street virus. Okay, and there's different ways to overcome it. They all sound great, and we have a really good story, by the way, because we overcame it. But again, I, I get to talk about overcoming it. I wasn't the person in the lab working on, all day and on the weekends to overcome it. But you could use the apical, tip, 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 apical meristem tips, okay, using the meristematic tip of a plant. And if you do it correctly, theoretically, it doesn't confer, allow the virus to go to the next generation when you regrow the plants. Depending on how close you get and how good you are, you could reduce the virus load or you could erase the virus load. But this is a picture of a basal meristem. This is, a, uh, this is from an infected plant. This is after we can get the, the, the tissue culture, that is the apical stem tip. We get it to go in. We get it to differentiate itself. So the plant, once it forms undifferentiated tissue, we subject it to different chemical and, and, and growth factors that the plant starts to differentiate into roots and shoots. And eventually we get roots and shoots and a, and a plant. And then after culture and continued culture, and, and what we're very fortunate at Rutgers is we have an expert that simply does apical stem tip meristem culture on fruits and other plants. So when you get disease-free and index-free fruit of strawberries from greenhouses, um, they come in from this type of technique. And we use that same technique, copied it to subject it to basil with some modifications, and it, it seemed to work. Then the question is, not all of it came out virus-free, by the way. Some of it came out with a reduced virus load, but we have some plants on some conditions with some techniques, some approach now that we have confidence, and we've done this through a, a virus testing kit to show that the material is now virus-free. Now we're propagating that back up. And those materials, should you like that form of the plant, and should you like the taste and aroma, which, by the way, you know, we don't guarantee. It's up to you to tell us whether you like it. That's ready to go. That's ready to be commercialized. Because that's downy mildew resistance. It's sterile. It can't be stolen. We, we understand what it is. And it's a really, it could be a good plant. Or it could be the plant that you scratch and smell and taste, and you kind of like it, but you don't like it enough. And then you tell us to go make more sterile hybrids. So we wait for your feedback on that as well. So the breeding efforts that we've done, um, we could update the slide. But this is the same type of process that Robert went through. We have, our, uh, we have our selfs, we have our winter nurseries, we have our crosses, we do it under different growing seasons. And we're getting very close now to feeling confident that we're near the, near the point after this F4, when we get to the F5, we'll be able to have the individual lines that are ready to go, we're ready to use as inbred lines to cross with others. And we have good material that looks good, is mildew, resist, is mildew resistant, but may not have any flavor at all. And we have actually some lines that could be good simply to give, to use, for others to cross something into as well. So we're trying to approach it from a, a, a number of different lines. Our key goal is to try to understand the genetics and the breeding. And to the extent that we can have lines that we release, it's great. To the extent that we can help all of us find genetic resistance is really our overall goal. So we have multiple breeding lines with tolerance and resistance to downy mildew. We're excited about the tolerance. We're much more excited about the resistance. We've, we have new, we found new sources of genetic resistance to Fusarium wilt that's been identified in, in Osama basilicum as well as other Osama species. And we use, we're using that now to develop new sweet bays or breeding lines. The Fusarium is really newer on board. We really only started this since Catherine had finished the masters, overcame the, uh, overcome the excruciating pain of having to do a thesis and defending it, give her a couple months. Now, we, now we're back, she's back in the greenhouse and we're kicking up that Fusarium program as well. And I think concert with the, the Massachusetts group, it could be a really good collaboration as well. We have a method now that has been developed for the regeneration of virus-free plants. We didn't expect to have to do that, by the way. That took a lot of people, a lot of time. Adolfina, Krok, Adolfina stand up. You came late. Sorry, she's too shy, too, but she's another collaborator that you saw at the beginning of this morning, but she has the tissue culture expertise and helps us in that and works on the genetics of the plant. And then we're in very process, very heavily, very, very intensely now moving on the DNA markers that are being developed to better hallucinate the gene action in, in basal and to generate other genetic markers okay, for disease resistance. So that, that's really where we are. Uh, we'll find out more details for those that come up to the program tomorrow. You'll have a chance to go through the greenhouse to scratch and see some of these plants. However, you have to note that the plants are not in, growing in the greenhouse for your edification and pleasure. 
So that what does that mean is we have plants that might be two or three years old that are from the same mother stock, and we all know that when we look at the phenotype of a plant that you're growing it come almost like a bonsai versus a young basil seedling, it's not going to look and taste necessarily the same as well. But I think you'll be able to see and appreciate the type of diversity. So from us, from the breeding aspect, really we first thank USDA because they're paying for all this. Okay, they pay for your lunch, by the way. Now, talking about that, you all filled out your survey? Well, the growers, because otherwise you're paying us for the lunch. Okay, so you, okay. I'm half joking, half not. But uh, we, we thank our partners at Cornell University, Meg, Florida, Rick, Joan, Ann, at UMass, Rob Wick, Angela, and, and Lee June. And at Rutgers, of course, we have a, a large team that we don't always thank because they're just part of our local family as well. But we really get, our work is guided by a lot of you in the audience. You've had a lot of patience with us and always give us good ideas, and we really want to thank you for everything. So thank you. Does that mean that uh, a taste test tomorrow is uh, totally off the board? No, no, no. We could taste. Um, now, you, no, you could taste. But uh, I'm suggesting that sometimes when you taste basil, when it's young and perfect, it tastes in a certain way, right? And when you wait till it's post flowers, it gets a little bitter. And then when you taste the plant, if you want to taste it after it's been sprayed, because we have to keep our we use pesticides in our greenhouse. Our greenhouse is not organically managed. Okay then you have to you sign that liability away, okay? So no, you could taste, you just can't take anything with you, okay? You, if you thought metal screening was in, security was intense at the, at the airports, wait till you come up to us at Rutgers. Um, but no, we really would like a lot of you guys, a lot of the growers and, and companies out there have really helped sh shed the light of, you know, helping to find what is an acceptable basil, what is an acceptable aroma and smell. And, and, and sometimes we as universities, we try to look for the perfection and that ne doesn't necessarily solve something that you could be doing where you don't need perfection. You just need something of excellent quality that's stable and has the right th market acceptance. So th this is the feedback. So we want you to see that everything we're talking about is real. We're trying to be conservative with what we have. We're very excited about the genetics and the, and the resistance that we've been able to do. And this is the first time that the plant seems to be following an actual Mendelian genetics. It's a polyploid, by the way, so it doesn't operate like a normal plant. I mean, it is a normal plant. But the genetics of it are unusual because the chromosome number is unusual. It's not as you find in other vegetable crops. So when you try to do a lot of the genetics, it operates very differently. And so we've been lucky in this in the downy mildew in a short period of time. Okay? So much further along than we were for those that heard this last year in Homestead or last winter here in, New Jer in at the New Jersey Vegetable Growers Association. We're getting very close. Are there any questions for any of our speakers today or any general comments overall? Now is your chance. We'll find a uh, larger group of basal experts anywhere else in the world right now. At this point in time, they're all here. <laughs> or you guys are all here. Comments? Somebody. So then let me ask two requests. A, for those that are planning to be at the meeting tomorrow, we're purposely holding it at Rutgers so that you could see our greenhouses, you could see the plants. At the, at the Hel at Heldrich Hotel, we're having a, a reception. What time is the reception tonight? Eight. Eight o'clock? It's only for pre-registered guests. Only for pre-registered guests? Okay. okay. So for those that are pre-registered, um, please come because there'll be, um, it'll be a good time for us to talk and have a chance to go through. You know, sometimes when it, there's not as much discussion in, during this presentation format, as it will be one to one, but all the researchers and, and we hope many of our partners will be up there. Okay. Survey. Thanks. Ramu, have you gotten surveys? Who Go has surveys? So far. Any more? All right. We appreciate it. Any more? Now, for any growers that aren't able to come up tomorrow, that want to see the plants, just let us know, and you. You're welcome to come up at a different day to come to other, to other greenhouses with us. Thank you very much for coming. For those that aren't going to come tomorrow, 